This is Bandit Safari Basic Podcast. This is Antic, the Atari 8 bit podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. In 1982, Bruce May created Magic Castle, a game for the Atari 800 computer. He finished the game, but was unable to find a publisher for it, so hardly anyone played it. In October 2019, he sent me scans of his original documents regarding Magic Castle, his design notes, and even uh, scans of the rejection letters from the three companies that he submitted the game to, Catalyst Technologies, Avalon Hill, and Origin Systems. He hasn't been able to find the floppy disks with the game, but he does have printouts of the source code, which he also scanned and sent to me, so it could potentially be resurrected by the Atari community. This interview took place on October 13th, 2019. Check the show notes at ataripodcast.com for links to Bruce's design documents, the rejection letters, and the source code. I mean, this is 1982, and uh, I was fascinated with computers. I was actually um, just finishing up uh, my bachelor. I I have a BS in biology, and... um, um, I just was, I saw a T, uh, you know, the Radio Shack computer, what, what was that, a TR-80 or whatever? TRS-80, sure. Yeah, and uh, so I just, I bought an Atari 800, and it had a basic cartridge, and I played around with that, learned how to program it, and it was just the first, later on, I actually took Fortran and RPG um, and decided uh, I didn't want to make my living programming. So I switched gears and I focused on marketing. I got involved in marketing and media and online media. Um, but uh, so that my adventure with the Atari 800 was my one attempt to play around and see what I could do. Um, and I kind of pushed all the limits as far as I could with it at the time. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Cool. So you got the uh, the 800 and started teaching yourself uh, basic and... Yeah, well, what happened was we, there was one computer store in Houston at the time. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, the industry barely existed. When I actually finished the program, I tried to sell it, but there were only three game companies on the planet, and I don't think any of one was worth more than a million dollars. Um, but uh, I, all and all the games were, you know, mostly just text-based. You, you know, you'd sit there and you'd type in, it would say, you're in a dark room. And you would say, well, we'll go left. And go, okay, you, now you're in a dark cave, you know. Right, yeah. yeah. And it, was, it was pretty pretty boring. I mean, the most interesting stuff was, was at the arcade, you know, with Pac-Man and stuff like that. So, but I was in there one day and somebody had written a game and it ran on the Atari 800. Uh, and they, they uh, had mi- they built the first map I'd ever seen seen on a computer you know like a strategy game map Mm -hmm. and it scrolled up and down and i thought it was really cool but i was kind of irritated because it was like well maps aren't supposed to just go up and down they're supposed to go left and right Mm -hmm. so um i started poking around and i don't know where i found the the assembly language codes but once i did um i very quickly learned how to write a program that could poke and peek into the memory it only had 64k of ram um, but I wrote a program that would just display the memory on the, on the screen so I could scroll up and down and see what it was doing just for the fun of it. And then I very quickly discovered where the display memory was stored. So I figured, okay, that's where you put the map. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, I need to write some code that can move data from one place in memory to the screen memory. And I did that. And at then at that point, I'm just looking at letters, you know, ASCII codes, just you know, gibberish letters. And mm-hmm. so then I had to go back and figure out how to to uh, create blocks, how to reprogram the ASCII codes and create building blocks to build something. So I figured that out, and and I made my first very basic map that scrolled up and down, just like the one the game I had seen. So then I thought, okay, well now how do I make it go left and right? So I created a map that was literally nine times bigger than the screen, right? You could go up and down one unit and left to right one unit. Um, and then and I got it where I could, with a couple of loops, um, I could move all that memory to any point on the screen. 
and thus I had my map that would move up and down or left and right. So I was pretty excited about that. And then I thought, well, now what do I do with it? So I thought, well, why don't I try and build a castle? So I, I polished off my building blocks and built walls and doors and stuff. And I built my first floor and then I built the second floor and then the third floor. And then I built a underground bunch of tunnels and stuff. And I thought, well, okay, now I got to make a game. So I started trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this and make some sort of strategy game? And I thought I wanted to keep it simple. So I came up with the idea of searching for objects and I made six magic objects and I wanted to give them some sort of power. I wasn't sure how that was going to work, but I wanted to give them some kind of power. So I did that. Uh, and then I said, well, um, there's got to be some challenge here, right? So I created six bad guys and uh, there was a sorcerer and a troll and um, anyway, six, each one of these six things would engage with the magic objects in certain ways, right? So one thing they would do is they would steal one, right? So that would be a challenge. You've, you had to find all six and take them back to the, the throne room in the castle to win the game. But if you ran into any of these bad guys, they'd steal them and you have to start over or start searching for those again. And that worked pretty good. Um, and then I, I, I made one of them was a key, right? So there were, there were doors that were locked and if you got the key, then you could unlock those doors. So some of the objects would obviously be behind the door. So you'd have to find the key first. Um, and then uh, I made uh, a crystal that if you had it, you could transport yourself anywhere in the castle, but only from one particular room. Uh, and that was really useful. Um, and uh, let's see. And then there was a map that if you had the map, um, you could, well, I have to back up. I actually created three mazes. Uh, and if you had the map, you could get out of the mazes. You could actually see the walls of the maze, which made it easier to get out. If you didn't have the map, you couldn't see the walls, and it was really hard to get out. But I made the three, the three mazes uh, almost identical. So if, if you were looking, and they were the same size as the castle, so they were three times wider and three times taller than the screen. But if no matter which one you were in, you couldn't tell until you started moving around. So it was really difficult even then to get out of them. And the, I think it was a dragon. If you're in a dragon, he would toss you into the maze. So that made it a little more interesting. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, um, let me create some, uh, some wizards. So I had, a, um, I had seven wizards, and each wizard knew the location of one of the magic objects. So if you found them, that helped you find the objects a little bit quicker. Uh, and then I created some knights because I wanted to have a power level. So uh, I created some knights, and every time you bumped into one of those, you'd get you lose your power level would drop. And if you bumped into too many, you would you would die, and you would you couldn't you'd have to start the game over. Uh, and that all worked pretty good. Um, and then uh, if you had there was a, a magic ring, and of course it was you know made you invisible. That was. Uh, um, not a creative idea, but it was a good one, so I used it. <laughs> and um, if you had that, then you could get by the night. So by the time I got all that together, it started getting actually kind of fun to play, and it was also kind of difficult to win. And it really became, and my goal all along was to try to make strategy matter because it was ideally a strategy game, right? So by the time I was finished programming it, uh, I had at the point where the order in which you found the objects mattered. So you had to be, think about it and you had to have a strategy. Okay, what do I want to go for next? And everything that happened after that would, you would be forced to change your strategy, right? So if something got stolen, you'd have to go, okay, now how do I get it back? Um, and you had to avoid certain places because um, you, 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 there was a high risk that you might run into something that, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't want to run into, right? Like a troll or something. Um, and I did, uh, so I created probability mat matrices. So there was a, just a two dimensional array and I created, uh, I controlled the probability for what rooms things appeared in, whether there was a magic object or one of the bad guys. Uh, and, and over time you would learn just through experience that there were certain rooms 
there was a greater chance that things would appear in certain rooms and you would kind of intuitively learn that as you went along. Um, and then to kind of really polish it off, I did two other things. I created a, a dashboard, which I was able to put on the bottom of the display. So the last three or four lines of the display were, were a, was a dashboard and it listed the magic objects that you found. It listed your power level uh, and had a couple other things it did. And then um, I, there were, at this point, there was a lot of things to keep track of, it just in your mind, you know, what did you have and, you know, um, wh where might they be? So I created a, a, uh, a special page and you could toggle, like I think you could hit the shift key or something, and you could toggle from the main game map to this other information page that had a map of the castle and it had a list of all the objects. And if you had run into a wizard, it would list where it was, not specifically, but generally where it was. And it would say whether you had it or whether it had been stolen. So you could kind of keep track of where you were. And that turned out to be really useful because from time to time, you would have to change your strategy on how you'd want to win. So you could pull that up and just sit there and look at it and think about it and then make up your mind what you wanted to do. Um, and then I also went back and uh, I made it so that um, if you ran into a wizard and he told you where one of the magic objects was, it would appear on that map, on that, that information screen. So it had, it had an awful lot of bells and whistles to it compared to anything on the market at the time. I mean, there was just nothing like it. And I, I almost got addicted to it myself. It was so much fun to play. So I know you tried to get this published, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But did, so did anybody play this other than yourself? Do you have playtesters or family or any friends yeah. play it? Well, I had a few people I showed it to, um, but it, not a lot. You know, I did most of the game testing myself, um, and it was it was an important goal of mine to debug it perfectly because it was, you know, it was very irritating to me if you bought a game or anything at that time and it didn't work. Um, and it wasn't that hard to deprogram, I mean, because you – I had total access to everything that was happening. You know, I had, had, I could display the memory on the screen and I could track stuff and I created code to track stuff to figure out, you know, if something wasn't working right, I'd figure out what it was and I'd fix it. Um, and really I, I spent a, a, a couple of months just making it run perfectly. Um, and I also, um, I, you had to load it. Um, using a disk. So at the time, you could buy an external hard drive for the Atari 800. Uh, in order to run the game, you had to have the basic cartridge in the 800, and you had to have the hard drive. So uh, the game was stored on a disk, and I would and you, I would load it up. And uh, one of the things I did I was I figured out how I could create a disk that was copy protected because I was didn't want anybody to steal it. <laughs> and uh, and I did that. Um, but then, stupidly, I gave the code away to those companies when I was trying to sell it, so they got it anyway. Uh, but then, then I spent a couple of months game testing it, just kind of making sure it it worked pretty well, right? So, generally, you'd get you could win two out of three times, and it would take you from fifteen thirty minutes to play a game. So, um, and I did almost all that game testing at that level myself. Hearing your description and reading your documentation, it it, it seems a little like um, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred Hundred game uh, Adventure. H had you played that? Were you familiar with that game? No, I haven't. Hmm. No, I never got a Twenty Six Hundred. and never saw it. Huh. Cool. Um, all right. So you wrote this game in mostly in BASIC, I think, with some machine language for the, the scrolling, uh, and. You sent it off to three companies. Tell me, tell me what happened. Well, I got rejection letters from all three, and uh, you know, they again, you know, the industry barely existed, uh, and they uh, two of them were real nice about it. Um, they said, you know, we're just we just don't have the bandwidth to take on something like this. Um, and one of them, actually, the guy was from Houston, which is where I'm from as well. Um, and he was about my age. He's a pretty young guy at the time. Um, and, and they were short and sweet, but, um, and then one of them, which was sort of probably my favorite one, it's, they said, uh, something more or less to the fact that, uh, well, they weren't interested in the game, but they were impressed with my programming skills and they wanted me to continue sending them all my code. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. 
Hmm. Um, but no, that it, it just like there just was such a fledgling time, right? The industry really barely was getting started, and uh, I just walked away from it. There, I didn't see any opportunity for me to make a living programming games at the time, which you know I was, as they say, ahead of the curve, a little bit too far ahead of the curve. So I moved on and did other things. It sounds like you were frustrated with the, the whole experience. Oh, I, well, I was. I mean, it was a lot of fun to do, but then, you know, I'd done it. And um, um, honestly, the um, I could see that it was going to get a lot more complicated. Um, I, had, I bought a DOS machine, which I used in my business to write some simple little programs to do, do some things. And it, and it was it was nice because just like the Atari 800, you had total transparency. You could see into the memory. There were no hidden files. Um, you had you, and it made it easy to perfectly debug anything. And when Microsoft Windows came out, I got my first Windows machine, and I saw how much stuff was hidden. I, I was even more frustrated. I thought, my gosh, this is ridiculous. Uh, I don't know how you, anybody can live in this kind of environment. Um, and uh, but I, you know, in terms of being aspirational for gaming, it was just no. It was way too early. I, there was no opportunities to speak of out there. It sounds like you weren't familiar with uh, the Atari Program Exchange. No. Uh, this so this is too little, too late for you. But your program probably yeah. would have been perfect for them, <laughs> which was basically user written software for the Atari that that. that then, then the the Atari company would sell directly, and then would give you a cut. Um, so, wow, didn't know about it. That's interesting. Too bad. Yeah. Um, so you didn't do any other programming projects with uh, with the Atari machine? No, that was it. And uh, I mean, it was sort of like I I had taken it to you know the most complicated level I could imagine, and I polished it off. So I felt like, ooh, okay been there done that done it as well as i could ever do it and, mm -hmm. you know time to move on sure uh, yeah and, and i mean my frustration has been over years because i i never nobody bought it was nobody even knew it existed right and i saw people coming along over the next several years doing things that i'd done and you know wow i was like well too bad nobody knows i did it right so you but you saved all of your your documentation and uh your all your your notes and everything it were did, yeah tell me i mean were you surprised when you unearthed all that and you're like oh here's the thing i did tell me about that no i've had it for years and i've always kept it um here's here's kind of an interesting story what happened next uh had nothing to do with atari 800 per se but uh when my uh, my i had two sons and when they were little i was kind of frustrated with the school system um uh, and uh, it just seemed like they were dumbing my kids down. You know, they they were not teaching them how to be creative thinkers, right? They're teaching them to just memorize stuff and do simple math, and um, they weren't even teaching them to be good writers. So I was really frustrated with the school system at the time, and I thought I need to do something um, to help them along here if I can. So I decided I told them about the game, they, and I my Atari 800 by that point was – long been thrown away and it quit working and I just trashed it. But I told them about the game and I thought, well, you know, why don't we do a board version of it? Right. So, and they were pretty young at the time. They were, you know, six, seven, eight years old. So we did a, we did a kind of a, a board version and we had to, it ended up being a completely different kind of game, but it was inspired by that. And it was kind of similar. Um, but it was all just, you know, decks of cards and boards and the board and dice and stuff. Uh, and that turned out to be a never ending project. And they would, you know, every summer they'd ask me about it and we'd get it out. And um, I got them thinking creatively about, you know, okay, what do you want to do? You know, make up a rule. Let's change how this works, right? Which was real interesting to get, you know, I'd never done that with anybody other than myself, but it was, a, it really illustrated, it was very, you know, how creative even young kids can be if you stimulate their thinking. So it was a lot of fun and we worked on it for years. We ended up changing the name 
we ended up calling it Scoven's Castle because my kids are named Scott and Kevin, so we mashed that together and called it Scoven's Castle. Um, and now my youngest son graduated from Texas Tech uh, a couple of years ago with a degree in computer science, and he's now in the process of trying to turn Scoven's Castle into a, an online game. And I'm you know, I'm enjoying watching him do that. So <laughs> we'll see where that goes. Oh, cool. So this, this thing that, that started off in 1980-something as a Atari game might come around again to be a modern online game. Yeah, it might it might be the light of the day. It will be called if you ever see it, it'll be called Scoven's Castle. Very um, cool. And he's working on it, and they, you know, there's um, he knows a lot more about how to do that than I do. Obviously, I, I'm, I can just kind of watch over his shoulder, but he's uh, he knows all the tools to use, and uh, he's making some progress with it. So we'll see. Cool. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that you 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 saved all that. Uh, documentation and your 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 notes and creating it and and sent the, all those scans to me so I will put those online so that people can can see it. Um, yeah, good explain. Uh, so I I think I I told you I sent you the the compiled code but I didn't because I'd forgotten what it was. There are two files. There's one file that is I scanned in all the actual code I wrote, mm -hmm. uh, and that includes all the basic programming codes. Most of that is stuff that sets the game up, you know, that creates the arrays and changes the ASCII codes. And it ta it would take it a couple of minutes to go through that to set it up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you booted it up, it would just say Magic Castle on the screen. And it would be, I actually put a little timer there so you could time how long it took. <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, because it took a long time at first, and I managed to make it a little more efficient later on, so it only ended up only taking about two minutes to set up. Um, and then there's the semi-language subroutines there, kind of toward the end of that. That's about 14 pages, so uh, all of that was written in 14 pages. The other file, which I thought was a source code, is actually the ASCII codes for all the maps. So there's about 20 pages of that, and that's, uh, those are all ASCII numbers, and that's all that is. Right. So the first thing to do it would load up all that data in the memory. It load up the, the the program and then all that data, and then it would it would kick into gear. Uh, but you could you can literally recreate anything in the game just by looking at those ASCII codes. And mm -hmm. if you know where to start, you can literally recreate the blocks, the characters, everything. So you know they were pretty tiny because it was just eight bit maps to play with, but. If you sort of imagine the size of a letter turning into something that looked like a witch or a wizard, I managed to kind of do that, pull that off. Sure. Uh, but that's the data there. So, and I, and I, I'm still looking for the floppy disk because it's disappeared on me. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to come to find it. Uh, but I'm gonna definitely try because I, I uh, now that I know you can uh, run it, I'm gonna try to get it to you so you can actually see it. Great. Yeah. I'm, I, I and many other people would certainly love to uh, give it a shot. So that's it. That's the story of how I built the game and how it worked. All right. Is there anything else about and, that time I should have asked you that uh, I didn't? No, I mean, you know, it's just, you know, my personal life. Um, so I went, uh, I told you I got involved in, in, uh, in media and marketing. I got involved in video production in the 90s. I learned how to do that. Mm -hmm. And that led to other things. But um, I relied on, you know, my limited experience of programming pretty heavily. Uh, I got involved with a company that built out the very first ever uh, broadband television platform. It's kind of like Hulu before Hulu existed. And this was back like 2000 to 2008. And, uh, you know, we, we were, um, we built the platform and sent out encoder. And so we could enable broadcasts. Of events worldwide, we we one of our we did a lot of firsts. So we broadcast Indy 500 to 88 countries around the world. That was back I think 2005, six and seven, right in there that period. And we did some other things like that. What was the name uh, of this company? Before, the company was called White Blocks, mm -hmm. and it eventually went under. Our main competitor at the time was Brightcove, and they kind of cornered the market. Um, uh, Barry Dillard, I think he raised something like $60 million. So he, he, he built a pretty good team that 
honestly built a better product, but um, it was a fun time. And uh, I, you know, intuitively understanding how computers work, I learned all that from the Atari 800. I know it's gotten a lot more complicated, but at the end of the day, you know, I understood how to program. I understood how to write a good program that wouldn't crash. Or, um, and, and intuitively, all that knowledge, I actually ended up applying it um, and took that to a pretty high level working in the industry, working all, you know, New York, L.A. I even, back in those days, I even was appeared on a lot of panels at Digital Hollywood events and other places in L.A. and New York. So that was really, you know, although it was a frustrating time for me, you know, and it never went anywhere with, back in 80, in the early 80s. In the end, it actually was significant part of my career and I, I relied on it uh, uh pretty effectively awesome and what do you do today well I, I doubled down on the media side i learned from that experience that i didn't want to sell technology ever again <laughs> it's for us you know it's like there's always there's somebody else that's building something better you know and you don't see it coming i uh, said so now i'm going to go back i want to be on the uh, like you i said i want to be on the content side so i ended up going back to my friend who had taught me video production 20 years ago and uh he he um and i'd done a radio show with him before but he, he offered me an opportunity to get involved with him uh in doing a television show on channel 21 here in houston so um i'm doing that and um uh, and being i'm being very creative and innovative with the, the business model selling leads rather than impressions but other than that um I'm sort of I'm sort of at the age I really should retire. I don't think I ever will, but um, I'm having fun doing this. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So, uh, last question: uh, If you could send a message to the people who are still out there playing with their Atari computers, what would you tell them? Well, and, you know, um, the it, it's really kind of an amazing machine. I, the twenty six hundred, I think, isn't that different. So. It's amazing because if you get the assembly language code, you can really, I mean, you can figure out how everybody did everything. Um, and you, you can get really creative with it. So if you look at Magic Castle, if we ever get it up and running or find an emulator to run it, um, I think they'll see just how far you can take it. Uh, and uh, even if you are um, a modern programmer, I mean, to me, it's, it's like the history of gaming. So it's fascinating to go in. Uh, I really... In fact, I discovered you um, by reading an article by two professors that were basically described themselves as um, digital archaeologists, and they were writing, they wrote an, a, a professional journal article on uh, one of the games that was almost that old, and so I contacted them, and they connected me to you, but, you know, I think it's just a fun space uh, when you get to the, you know, the as soon as you get to another operating system like windows or, or 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 the apple either one you you add this layer of complexity that makes everything seem obscure and you don't really know exactly how it works with the atari 800 you really can understand how computers work from you know the digits up you know uh, and it's worth knowing that you know because it's not uh, it's not rocket science once you get it and once you understand it, you go, oh, I see how you can take these very simple assembly language codes and do something magical like create a map and make it move around and then get even more creative and actually make a game that's fun to play. And I think that's a good exercise. So I encourage anybody to poke around and learn more about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bruce. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed the interview. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org/donate. Thanks.